in our lifetime, we've imagined a left and a right in this you know, game of ours. It's the liberal and the conservative. I should do it the other way because this is my right, but it's your left. The liberal and the conservative, the Democrat and the Republican, right? We're thinking like that. We're thinking those who like big government and those who want self-governance. We're imagining this tennis match, if you will, the basketball court, whatever. It's this back and forth kind of war that we have have in our mind's eye. It's been this way for years. The paradigm today is different. The difference is it's Democrats and Republicans, those who are in power and like the power and authority of telling you what light bulb you can buy and how many gallons of flesh you need in your toilet, those who are in power and believe in the authority and the power of the state over and above the individual. This is them, those elites, and us as common everyday citizens, taxpayers, and ratepayers. We are the ones who are carrying the will of those who are in power, and that's not the way America was designed. America was designed around the concept of self-governance. That means you have jurisdictional responsibility for yourself, for your family, for your business, <coughs> for your home, for your school district, and those boundaries expand as the, the um, what would you say, the ripple of your presence in this world expands. So that pebble in the pond slowly grows out and becomes less and less important the farther out it gets. That's quite frankly why you feel unimportant at the federal level. By the time that pebble in the pond reaches Washington, D.C., they don't even notice. But I tell you, right here, the county commissioners recognize your presence. Your school board knows you're there. I recommend everyone show up to your school board meetings and start making a difference right now. This is the only hope we have. I'm back to Ken for, sorry. If, if two years from now you have been the congressman and not Greg Walden, what will be different or why would that have been a good thing? The, uh, the best answer I can give, that this is a very good question and a hard thing because we think in terms of Republicans and Democrats and we're, we've got this view, so any old Republican is good. I'm making a different argument. I'm saying what sort of individual, what sort of Republican are we looking for? During the omnibus budget bill of a month or so ago, five weeks ago, there were 64 Republicans that voted against the omnibus. The omnibus violated every pledge that the House uh, put together in their Pledge 2010. If you ever read that document, it's at pledge.gop.gov. And you can read that pledge to America where they said they would no longer consider omnibus bills, they would divide the bills up into the 12 different departments and pass each department of its own accord. So the omnibus bill we got six weeks ago, five weeks ago, however long, it is a violation of that from the GOP. It passed, but there were 64 Republicans that voted against it and three Democrats. That's 67. I want to be 68. And we had four last week in um, Texas. I was hoping for five out of Texas. Four is better than none. We got one in Florida, right? Now we're, we're, we're moving up. We, we will soon have 87, and then 107, and 137. America will not survive if we don't get involved and take action within our own communities and rise up to the task that's before us. And this is bigger than Republican and Democrat. Thomas Paine wrote in Common Sense, 1776, he said, let the name of Whig and Tory become extinct. Let me hear those no more. Let the name of Republican and Democrat become extinct. He says, what I care about is open and resolute friend, good citizen, and um, 
independent and a strong supporter of the rights of mankind and the free and independent states. That's what I'm here tonight for. I'm looking for men and women who want to be good, resolute, could be good citizens, open and resolute friends, and want to defend the rights of mankind and want to support freedom and independence for each of our individual states and not see the federal bureaucracy crush us out of our existence. Yes? Um, you mentioned the Republican in Florida, and um, he was an unknown lobbyist. Uh, he ran against a person who ran for governor that had all kinds, a Democrat had all kinds of name recognition, money, connection. Uh, I read that Speaker Boehner called the Republican three or four times, said, are you going to play ball with me? Are you going to vote for me for Speaker? And evidently he said, no, I'm going to be independent like you're talking about. And the Republican Party said to themselves, this guy's going to get beat big time. He doesn't have the money, he doesn't have the name recognition. Uh, the other candidate does. And they even put it, the Republican Party even planted an article in Politico that said, this is a really lousy candidate. So guess what? Two days, three days later, he wins. And so what I want to know is, what are you going to say to Speaker Banner when he calls you or when you're in Washington and he calls you in the office and he says, you better play ball with me or you don't get any money or you don't get this. You know, maybe you don't even get a good office, you know. Uh, what are you going to say to him? Well, I'll be happy to be in the basement. Um, <laughs> you know what, the, the, the truth is, I don't get any money from the Republican Party today. And you ask, why not? Because Greg Walden is the chair of the National um, Republican Congressional Committee. So no money flows through, you know, I, I'm raising my hand, I'm a Republican, any for me. And uh, we're all, you, you folks who have come here tonight, I have to give you the credit. This is a Friday night, right? You could be doing a thousand other things that you had planned before the phone started ringing and that same person was on the other end saying, are you going to come, are you going to come? I'm teasing, I don't know how often they pestered you, but I appreciate you coming. <laughs> and quite frankly, we are the difference. You have to think about that. Part of Ken's question is, Dennis, how will you make a difference? The truth is, I can't make any difference. We can. That's the secret. We can. This is grassroots. This is community. This is where we engage. This is where we make a difference. And I will be more than happy to tell Speaker Boehner I will not vote for him. Yay. <laughs> yes. Could you include Eric Cantor too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <coughs> a question over here. What are the four or five talking points that friends of mine say, well, okay, let's let the guy, so what's he going to do? How much different is he than Greg Walden? What are the four or five key oh, points yeah. Say he's going to do this, this, this? The, the best way to see tons of facts on voting record is on my, uh, th this website over here. Ken's going to bring this up while we're talking. And um, in that, uh, on that website, they show you Club for Growth, Freedom Works, Heritage, and the Madison Project. The Madison Project has Greg Walden in their Hall of Shame. And we also have it on door hangers. Did I bring one of those up? Here's Vanna White coming towards me. <laughs> this is my wife, Diane. And uh, you'll see on this card, we have... Madison Project, Greg Walden gets an F. Club for Growth, he gets a D minus. Club for Growth is really interested in business um, acumen. And so they give him a little bit better grade. They're not so uh, keen on right to life or Second Amendment. They're keen on business. Then uh, Heritage Action, he gets an F. And Freedom Work, he gets an F. On, these are clickable on my website so that you can actually jump to Freedom Works and read what they say. But to be real precise, the federal forest and the management problems we described earlier are, you know, the number one problem for all of Eastern Oregon. The federal land should be ceded to the states. Number two, and 
remember, all of the western states, all of these states that are red here, are all working on that in their own legislature. So right now, uh, Utah has done a great job with the, um, the Federal Lands Transfer Act within their state legislature. And along with the Federal Lands Transfer Act, they passed legislation that said all representatives and senators at the state level have to engage in continuing education to learn and stay schooled on states' rights within a federated government. Now, can you imagine passing a law that says our own men and women who are serving in Salem have to go to school to recognize the value and beauty of federated government and states' rights? What a this, good idea. It's beautiful stuff. I mean, they've really done a good job in Utah. So it's happening in all those western states, and it's doable. The other thing, Greg Walden voted to defeat a single sentence amendment in the NSA NDAA scandal that would have said the NSA cannot use money to spy on Americans unless they're suspects, as defined in this legislation. So if they're suspects, great, go at them. You can look in their sock drawer, you can watch their email, you can listen to their phone calls, have at them. If they're just mom and dad, you don't have any authority to investigate them. There's no suspicion, you have no right, you're violating their Fourth Amendment. Greg Walden helped defeat that bill. These are easy things to knock out of the park. People just need to realize that Greg Walden has not been serving them well. With regard to the federal lands, here's a thing he pulled two weeks ago. It's a great big news article. It was a news day for Greg Walden. He suggested that the federal government cede 240 acres to the city of Hermiston for their ag experiment station because, quote, it will help their economy and they'll have independence and can make local decisions and Hermiston is the fastest growing city in Oregon. Now, really? if you're willing to give away 240 acres to promote good economy and local control and growing economies, why not see millions of acres to every county in the state? And this is just, you know, garner, trying to garner a quick vote here and a quick vote there. These things are well documented on my website. I suggest you go to um, Dennis2014.com. That's my uh, website. You can, you know, click around. We've got video recordings and uh, audio recordings and articles that I've written. I've been a commissioner for four years. I have a host of articles that you can also read on another news site, klamathnews.net, which goes back in time, and you can see what I was thinking when I was a wee little boy um, as a county commissioner, and I didn't know which way was up. That was four years ago. <laughs> yes? Um, I have a question about the effect or usefulness of the judge's ruling last summer about BLM and ONC Act, and they breached their that agreement and ordered the harvesting to take place. Is that useful or effective? Or? It, 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 it was useful simply because what the, what the judge basically said, you guys aren't doing your job. You've got to start cutting. And, you know, that that's, you know, cut to the chase. You guys have to start cutting. So now the, the, they are, quote, investigating, and this is the problem with bureaucracies. Once you get a bureaucracy that's this big, it's, it's a little bit the, the imagery is uh, best illustrated like trying to turn an aircraft carrier. How long does it really take to get an aircraft carrier turned around? And um, that's, that's what we're facing with this giant bureaucracy because the ruling is more than just BLM here in Oregon, right? It's Bureau of Land Management. So it's all the way back to the attorneys in Washington, D.C., and then figuring out how do we deal with this? What do we have to do? How do we manage the resources? What's our policy, et cetera? And they're trying to build that back and prove to the judge that they're trying as hard as they can. So it's a very slow go, but the ruling was good. We'll see what comes of it.
Yes. We have three county commissioners, Republican county commissioners who are a joke. You're a judge. <laughs> uh, Republican means nothing to them. Who would you say you are a reincarnation of? Thomas Jefferson, James <laughs> Matt, no, no. So who, who would you align yourself? If I'm talking to somebody else, they go, all politicians are crook. Doesn't matter, they're from Klamath, Jackson, they're all crook. Who would you align yourself with? I'd say, well, think of a reincarnation of Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, if you, if you were going to uh, try and reincarnate me, I would choose between Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson. What I don't like about Thomas Paine is he ended up stepping away from his Christian heritage and his faith. And he, he created um, you know, quite a turmoil in his later part of life and was ostracized for his, his statements against Christianity. And, um, and so, uh, you know, that, that doesn't sound like me. I'm going to stay true to my faith, and uh, I'm going to continue to walk with an absolute sovereign that, who I consider to be God himself. He's the one in charge, and what we have here on planet Earth is, if you will, jurisdictional boundaries for a responsibility. I mentioned this earlier. Your home, your family, your business, your community, your school district, your church body, your commissioners and county government, and the ripple goes out from there. But that's jurisdictional responsibility. The best way to illustrate bad jurisdiction is the marijuana laws that are being arm wrestled from state to fed and back in county governments and whatnot. I disagree with the marijuana policy as we'll see it erupt here in Oregon, because I think it's, a, um, it's, it's an immoral choice, but I'm using morals to, to you know, lay the groundwork. I have these sideboards that come from my Christian faith. The jurisdiction res responsibly belongs to the state of Oregon. The federal government has no jurisdictional responsibility for that dilemma. It belongs to Oregon, and Oregon can arm wrestle among citizens here. I would arm wrestle against it, but nevertheless, the federal government does not have jurisdictional responsibility. Remember, when the Constitution was created, there were only three laws that were highlighted as being federal crimes. Does anybody know what they are? Treason. Treason was one. Piracy was the other. Counterfeit. And counterfeit. counterfeit. Good, good. So those were the three. How many are there today? A hundred or two. No, there's, there's literally thousands, thousands and thousands. Do you realize John F. Kennedy was assassinated? He was president of the United States, assassinated in Dallas, Texas, and there was no crime for killing a president. What did the federal government do? They made a crime for it. Why? So they could prosecute at the federal courthouse. Why not let the state, why not let Dallas, why not? And this is one of those where the federal government is rolling along, absorbing authority and absorbing responsibility. And it's about time we simply said no. But think of how the American population was so torn with our president being assassinated, they were okay, sure, pass a law, pass the NDAA, pass the Patriot Act, it's okay. We need to protect ourselves from that horror that's out there, whether it be a terrorist or it be Lee Harvey Oswald. Help us, help us. And that's where we fall prey, because if you go to government and say, help me, they'll be more than happy to help you. And Ronald Reagan warned you about that already. Right? When somebody from the government says, I'm here to help, yeah. hold the hold back you. side of your pants, right? <laughs> Another question, yes? Uh, are, are we to assume then that you will not um, uh, make your votes on uh, considering social issues? In other words, that's not part of your platform, since that's not part of the federal constitution. You're asking an interesting question in terms of how it works. I think those social issues properly belong to the states. So now, now, as those things work 
through the, the bowels, I'll call it, instead of guts, you know, I'll call it the bowels of Washington, it, it will be interesting to see where they surface and what they look like. I, I have a degree in economics, so my real forte isn't in social issues. I use those, my Christian worldview to put boundaries on those things. But my economics comes from the federal government creates distortions in the market by using subsidies and tax credits and putting those energy. Has anybody driven along the, the uh, I-84, the gorge up in the Columbia River Basin? Not recently. Yeah. Not recently? There are, there are literally hundreds of these steel giants standing out there and they're frozen in time. They don't spin much and they're out there because they're wind power and they were subsidies and remember I described that all the other commissioners voted against calling renewable energy hydro-renewable because they wanted the subsidies. So those jobs came in, those three armed you know, windmills got created, and I know exactly how Don Quixote felt. I want to chase those things and knock them over, and they are a tragedy in our lifetime, they create expensive energy and they're wearing out the electrical components that are in our current grid because it cannot handle the surge during high winds. And now that it can't handle the surge, we're wearing out some of those switches. And we're talking like 500,000 volt switches. These are big deals. And when you wear one of those out, what do you do with it? Where do you put it? How do you replace it? How much does that cost? And so on. And so the distortions in the market created by federal intervention impact all of us, except for it's just a little poke here and a little poke there and a little poke here and a little poke there until you finally get sore and you're wondering why you're so sore. And you're wondering how will your children enjoy the life you enjoy? And chances are they won't. Chances are your grandchildren certainly won't if your children are enjoying their world today, will your grandchildren enjoy the freedoms? Well, they won't. They can't buy a light bulb, right? They can't buy a two gallon flusher. They'll be stuck flushing three or four times to get the stuff down, right? I already am. You, you already are. Uh, well, uh, don't tell us, share us your personal stuff. So. <laughs> these are fun. We laugh at these like they're funny. This is a tragedy in the making. This is a tragedy. Yes. One of the gentlemen talked about <coughs> the local people getting more involved and taking more control. And that's certainly what you're talking about. As commissioner in Klamath, and <coughs> did you have any experience with the constitutional sheriffs? And if someday we were to actually get a constitutional sheriff here in Jackson County, do you see things that you could do at the congressional level to help facilitate some of those actions? Yes, uh, the, the answer is yes. Today I was with Sheriff Lopey and uh, uh, Sheriff Poindexter, Modoc and Siskiyou County, or vice versa, Siskiyou and Modoc counties, and they're both constitutionally minded sheriffs. And our board of commissioners passed a resolution that would support the people against the NDAA, known as PANDA, and Oath Keepers where we, we um, made a resolution that we would uh, encourage our sheriff to not um, support sections 1021 and 1022 of the NDAA, which are the loss of habeas corpus and the indefinite detention of, um, of, of um, you know, quote, terrorists, you know, you know, use that label any way you want. We're all terrorists because you guys are listening to me. Right. The cameras up here have got every one of your faces recognized, and so we're all toast. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is your position on the uh, state of Jefferson <coughs> movement? Yeah, the, 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 the state of Jefferson is, is really interesting. I, I, think, I think better than the state of Jefferson. Jefferson's really a hard concept. Um, because you have to pull that away from 
uh, California and have it recognized by the federal government, and there, there's a lot of pieces there. Yeah. So what I would suggest would be better than the state of Jefferson is attacking the federal lands issue and get the ceded to the states, get those lands ceded to private parties, any number of individuals and, and businesses, and, you know, I keep saying it, even the tribes could do better in those federal lands than the federal government can. Sure. But I don't really expect the tribes to necessarily be our friends. They would be if they faced the real economy. They don't face a real economy because federal dollars are pouring into their veins. So as long as the federal government has got this giant printing press and is pushing money through the system, they can buy allegiance and cooperation from anybody, including your county commissioners, right? right? Including the fire district that I just described in my uh, county. So the government's money machine is the real problem because that is, after all, the love of money is what? The root of, the root of, all, root of all evil. This is avarice. Avarice is the problem we're facing in American politics today. Yes. yes. Yeah, how was, if you've been educated as economist, how did you go astray? <laughs> I, I'm not sure what, how to take that. I think you mean I'm a politician today. What did I do that was wrong? Um, I've been in private industry, like I said, for 30 years, and I was teaching a Sunday school class where, you know, I did the borrower shall become the lender slave. You weren't here when I told this story. And an individual in that class said, you ought to run for county commissioner, and I told him to go jump in the lake. You know, and, um, and then he was persistent enough. He was like the people who were in this room. He cared about America, and he cared enough about America to be persistent, and he cared enough about our founding fathers to say, Dennis, you know these things in your heart and soul. You've, you understand this historical perspective. You've made it part of your own family tradition. Diane and I homeschooled our children. So we, we did this stuff all the time. This is how we think and how we deal with life. And he was persistent enough to get me to throw my hat in the ring. I defeated a 10-year Republican incumbent. He was appointed for two, ran a four-year term, ran a four-year term, was ready to put in another four, and I defeated him even though nobody knew my name and I lived in Beatty, Oregon. Does anybody know where Beatty, Oregon is? <laughs> you know, so I'm right where Spring River Road T-bones into Highway 140 and there's nothing there for miles and miles and I am now a county commissioner because of men and women just like you in Klamath County and it's a wonderful <coughs> thing to behold. I also took a stand against the KBRA because as an economist, I see what a futile horror that entire damn scams thing looks like. And that's why I was in Doris, California today. We were talking about the bi-state alliance and the alternatives that are better than the KBRA is today. But Wyden, Walden, and all won't listen to those ideas. That's another item to put in your bailiwick. If those men and women, uh, a, a gentleman there today, Brandon Chris, he's a supervisor in Siskiyou County. He said, there's no doubt about it. Greg Walden has always consistently and continually been, and I think will always consistently exhibit in his actions and in his thought, the perfect attitude of a fence sitter. <laughs> and everyone, of course, had to smile. In other words, there is no left and right. It's all just sit here in the middle ground and hope I don't get any flack from either side because I'm so hard to pin down. So that's another item that we face. When will we have men and women who are willing to stand and make a statement and hold to it? Yes? Uh, with your economics background and your you know, private sector uh, experience, what, um, any comments or thoughts on the fair tax? Yeah, the, the fair tax, uh, the, the fair tax is, is an interesting, um, a, an interesting item and it's gaining, you know, some momentum. That's, uh, Nor what's Norquest's first name? Gro Grover. 
um, Grover Norquist has this fair tax idea, and the, um, it, the, the, the problem that I have with it is an interesting problem that, that may be hard for me to voice. Government always wants more, so fair is only fair for an instant, and then government wants more. I'll give you an example from our community. This is, it, it's not, you know, a slam <coughs> against seniors or anything, but we had a Meals on Wheels program and senior lunches. And um, Klamath County, as a commissioner in Klamath County, I said, we won't fund our portion, it was $30,000, because it's not a mandated service for the county. And I made a thousand different statements about how I thought real community Real compassion happens at the local level. It happens from individuals. Well, this is an important deal to a lot of people, and I recognize it's an important deal to a lot of people, but nevertheless, at some point, there's a responsibility like this Constitution that says, you have an obligation here, and you don't have an obligation, so rather than take tax money from everybody's pocket, what I was suggesting is those who want to get involved in this community effort should get involved in this community effort. And it seemed perfectly logical to push in that direction. So we did, and everybody did get involved. In fact, they raised $50,000 instead of the thirty dollars that they asked for from Klamath County. And I'm thinking, Dennis, thank you. The Lord, you have a soapbox, and this worked. What a fabulous win. We kept $30,000 in the county budget. They gained $50,000 from all of the people who contributed to their cause because people felt seriously about it. And I'm thinking, this is fantastic. What a win-win. Three weeks later, they were back at our doorstep at the county offices and they wanted $35,000. Now this is the problem with the fair tax, is it assumes government knows best, government will set the tax rate, government will tell you how much you owe, and I disagree with that concept. I think the people should decide how much they owe and not government, and any time you give them the ability to throw the throttle, they will do it, and this is government here to help you. Hang on, boys, here we go. Yes? Uh, Dennis, uh, if I'm like uh, other people in the room, <clears throat> I have tried to read the Constitution from stem to stern maybe uh, five or six times, and I'm rather, I have acted politically here locally, and I have lots to do, and I never seem to be able to get through uh, a, a true reading from stem to stern of the Constitution. What I'm proposing to you is, as a constitutional conservative, is to write a busy person's Constitution. <laughs> put it in simple language. In your spare time. And also put down your thoughts as to what the Constitution <laughs> really means. Yeah, yeah that's a good, it's a good suggestion. I have a couple of authors that are fantastic on this, and I'll, I'll share them with you. Actually, I'll, I'll put them up on our website so you can find them. The first is a gentleman named Clarence B. Carson. B stands for Buford. Now you know he was born in Alabama. And um, Clarence died last year. He was a historical economist, and he wrote a book. Um, actually, he wrote a, a, a ton of history books. But the book that I would suggest for those who want to know about the American form of government and the Constitution and a conservative, quite frankly, a Christian worldview of what that document represents and where it got created from in terms of history from Aristotle forward, the name of the book is Basic American Government. And it is fabulous. It's like 500 and some odd pages. If you want to know, phrase by phrase, <coughs> sentence by sentence, where the thought life came from to create the Constitution, the best book that I can recommend comes from uh, a gentleman, Cleon Skousen, S-K-O-U-S-O-N. Cleon Skousen wrote a book called The Making of America, and it's a phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, 
background history and arguments from the Founding Fathers for every single sentence. And it is a gem because you get to see their minds at work. And it's, it's actually a big book. It's a textbook, kind of big book. And it is a joy to read if you love Founding Fathers stuff. Um, but that's not what you asked for. <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, I'd love to put them up on the website. They are excellent material. Yes, I do. Uh, we are in the library, and it's open tomorrow from 12 to 4, and I'm sure they got lots of books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, those plus, ones. Plus, down at the Republican office, we have a lot more books, so. Yeah. If you can't want to find one here, you maybe can find one there. Yeah, good, good, Joe. Be careful, though. When you get into the Constitution section, it may be Marxism or something, you know, versus, you know. <laughs> People here should know better. Yeah, yeah, no. Yes? Uh, I wondered, uh, as one of the, uh, the proper functions of our federal government is our defense. And um, there's a lot of uh, things going on in the world. And how do you feel about us meddling, or whatever you want to call it, uh, or uh, do you feel like we should only defend ourselves if someone comes here? Good, very good question. I think when it comes to uh, it's what makes today's environment difficult is how messed up it has become in, in our lifetimes. Um, I like your use of the word meddling. We, we meddle all over the world, and I think that's destructive. It's destructive to those economies. It's destructive to those cultures. We could influence those cultures. Our founding fathers knew this also. They thought commerce was the best defense that America could, could use. And by commerce, for example, it would be um, production of oil and gas energy resources, for example. If we were producing our own energy resources from American assets and American soil and American natural resources, we would not be shipping boatloads of dollars, billions and billions of dollars on a daily basis to the Middle East. If we weren't shipping that money to the Middle East, would those dictators be in power today? They're using that money today for their own global perspective, not ours. If we had not been involved in this, you know, mindlessness for we'll become energy independent someday, we'll become energy independent someday, and never doing anything functionally about it, in the meantime, our natural resource dollars are getting spent elsewhere. At some point, the Ukraine-Crimea incident is the same thing. Putin has natural gas and oil resources shipping across the middle of the Ukraine. He could starve Western Europe in a heartbeat. We could provide natural gas resources if we had the Keystone Pipeline, if we had the, um, the pipeline that's supposed to end up here at Coos Bay, but no, we're doing an environmental impact study on that. The environmental impact study for that pipeline, by the way, was completed because it was supposed to be input to Cal Northern California, and the gas was going to be flowing inbound, so the pumping stations were going to be in Coos Bay, now the pumping stations are at this end because we're trying to export it. Apparently, when you do an environmental impact study, it depends which way the gas molecules flow because when we did it for them going east to west, it was okay when they're going west to east, ah, we've got to do it the other way. And so this is just bureaucracy run wild. The political crisis in America today is the federal government has gorged itself on power and knows not how to wield it in, in a reasonable fashion. That is what you and I face at a daily level, and that's why I need your help in running for Congress. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would like to put my perspective on the future. Uh,
and and uh, we're we're using eminent domain uh, to uh, to uh, allow pipeline uh, to go and export natural gas, uh, and and yet uh, I don't have natural gas at where I live. Uh, and, and I asked for natural gas, they put, they put a line in Shady Cove, and it was going to cost uh, about eleven or twelve hundred dollars. No, it was about eleven or twelve thousand dollars to run a line to uh, a home that, that's uh, maybe uh, two hundred feet off the, off of the uh, property. So, you know. Uh, if, if these companies and if the federal government would share in, in, in exporting fuel or importing fuel, but they don't. They, they use the club of eminent domain uh, and, and uh, you have to sell at whatever price that the, they say is adequate. And, and you do not share if a line goes across your property or uh, the value, any percentage value, there's no monthly fee that the companies or, or the government allows you to collect. And, and they tend to avoid going through uh, public lands, and yet they'll go through private lands. So there's a lot of things in, in this regard that I disagree with. Uh, well, let, let, me, let me slow you down here. Is your name Ray? Yeah, Ray Jones. Yeah, good. Nice heavier Ray. Let me slow you down because all of the issues that you identified were constraints placed upon the market by the government. Those are not free market, that's government involvement. So when you read my lips, understand I'm asking for the government to butt out. They don't have the right to take your land. Your property rights belong to you. If you choose to sell or lease, that's your business, and that's nobody else's business. And it's that business owner who is now running that pipeline, it's their right to decide where there's profit margin available for a CNG facility or not. But the federal government, as you identified three or four times in your description, the federal government is in there controlling prices, controlling access, and basically mucking with the market. And not only that, not only that, but this particular pipeline is running from the land to, uh, projected to be run from the land to Coos Bay, is, uh, is on, uh, I believe, is a, a Canadian uh, owned option. So they're using, uh, you know, our laws. To take advantage of what I think is not a good thing. Right. Well, there, there, no doubt, lobbyists are busy, you know, greasing the skids so that their corporate interests are met. <coughs> the, the solar subsidies, the wind generation subsidies, pipeline subsidies, all of these subsidies distort the market. You and I don't even know what things cost anymore. And the government is good at hiding this. For example, you and I will never know what it costs to bear a child in the United States ever again. Why? Because under Obamacare, I'm saddled with maternity <laughs> benefits. Are you kidding me? Every male here, if you haven't signed up already, you will soon be carrying maternity. And at some point, you have to scratch your head why. It's a way to distribute the cost and hide what's going on. We'll never ever know again what, how much did we take for that resource, how much did it cost. Whenever you separate decision making from cost, you create havoc. My number one rule of thumb is if you and I love individual liberty so much, we should also demand personal responsibility. You cannot separate individual liberty from personal responsibility and get any workable solution. We've done that with uh, health care. When your child breaks an arm, you don't care what it costs. You just drive down there and they set your child's arm. 
I suggest in a market-driven environment, you would know which doctor was the right doctor to go to based on how much it was going to cost and how many crazy tests they were going to do on your child. You don't have that privilege today. You're stuck in the system. This has been a long time coming. If you think we're on a downhill slide, we are. I'm suggesting first we stop the downhill progress and then we start trudging back uphill. And it'll take us, if we've been going down for 40 or 50 years, it'll take us 40 or 50 years trudging back. The question you're faced with is, is it worth it? Actually, none of us will be here in 40 or 50 years, right? Is it worth it though? And our forefathers said, yes, we believe it's worth it. It's worth our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And we are willing to try and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. This is beautiful stuff. I'm leaning on that fabulous scenario. I have nothing else to stand on. Uh, go. Um, on the reverse of that, the people who thought it was worth to start us on the downhill slide are not here now, but they thought it was worth it back then, even though they wouldn't be re reaping the benefits. So some people thought it was worth it for us to do the downward slide, and do we think it's worth it to say, no, stop, we're going back. Yeah. So over here. And my statement is, beginning is half done. Yeah, yeah, good, good statement. Uh, I don't want to, I can do this for hours and hours. I don't want you guys to get tired. You want to get snacks and walk around, or you want to keep listening to me drone on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Got another question? Yes. I just want to make a statement. Uh, my observation is, is that this country was founded upon the principle of the extreme sacrifice of the few for the benefit of the many who don't care. Yeah, you may be right. That's a typical Pareto rule. It's the 80-20. Even in the 20, it's an 80-20. And even in that 20, it's an 80-20. The Pareto rule is very universal. And even in the 80, there's a 20 segment, right? And it, it just keeps splitting out like that over and over and over again. So it is a handful of individuals like us who will make a difference. And you, what I'm asking you to do is be involved. I look for your commitment. First of all, I need your vote. My wife and I both need your prayers. And then I need any financial support you can give us because you see the two banners we own, right? <laughs> and uh, and we, we are going to tr give, do our best to try and put road signs out. But what I need more than road signs, I need your shoe leather. I need you to be willing to be involved, to convince five neighbors, to convince five friends. You may not want to bring up my name with family, but I would be blessed if you did. And then we'll see the results in our lifetime. And we will secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. And that's what I'm looking for. We'll be around. Uh, my wife has a little clipboard if you want to sign up for email. There's plenty of goodies here. <laughs> Enjoy yourself, and I'll be able to talk to you as we continue milling. Yes, one last Can comment. Can you tell us a little bit about Diane? <laughs> Diane yeah, Diane and I, I'll, I will. I this, follow it wherever you go. <laughs> yeah, Diane and I go wherever I go. Diane and I have been married 33 years, and we have two grown children who are both married. One lives in Bend, Oregon with her husband, and then our son and his wife live in um, Reno, Nevada. And uh, Diane and I met at a summer camp in the Yosemite Valley area. It was called Bass Lake Summer Camp at, at Bass Lake, just outside of Yosemite. I've been there. And it was love at first sight, right? 
<laughs> and um, anyway, and so uh, we, we've lived in California. We are now here in Oregon. We've been here for 18 years. Oh, and here's an interesting thought. Diane has um, enjoyed living off the grid now for 18 years, right, Diane? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a whole interesting lifestyle to have been off the grid for that long and have my wife still love me and uh, say, I'm glad we moved here because there's no way to bring power to there. <laughs> Do you mean to tell me that <clears throat> living off the grid is, is not illegal? Oh, it will be soon, but yep. it's not today. <laughs> Good job, Dennis. Okay, thank you. See ya.